I want to thank you all for coming. Good evening. My name is Pam Sador. Welcome to Radnor Memorial Library. And thank you for joining us. I know it's difficult to uh, Zoom once again, but I always find in the end uh, that it's nice to get together with people. And this is what we do. We Zoom. And the world is just looking a little brighter and better, but we have found the Zoom to be really valuable. We can build community. And that's what we're doing here at Radnor Memorial Library in Wayne, Pennsylvania. And tonight we are building community with Rotary Club of Wayne. This is our second event with Rotary Club of Wayne. And this evening, I would love to introduce you to Dr. Joseph R. Greenberg. Dr. Greenberg will be presenting tonight's event and the title of the event is Your Oral Health and Overall Health. And as I said, it is presented by the Rotary Club of Wayne. Rotary Club of Wayne, as we all know, part of Rotary International, the global service organization that honors all vocations and professions in its local community. And Dr. Greenberg himself is a 25 year Rotarian. That's what I see here in my notes. So uh, Dr. Greenberg, Dr. Joe, if you don't mind, I call him Dr. Joe. So Dr. Joe has a presentation this evening and it lasts about 45 minutes. And it's probably best uh, that we keep ourselves muted. Although Dr. Joe said at any time, if you would like, you can unmute yourself and ask a question because uh, he would like this to be an interactive experience this evening. And let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Joe Greenberg. Received his dental degree and postdoctoral dual specialty training in periodontics and fixed prostodontics, periodontal prosthesis from the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine. And he taught there for more than 40 years and he held the rank of clinical professor of periodontics. Dr. Greenberg has been appointed adjunct professor of restorative dentistry at the Kornberg School of Dentistry at Temple University. And that's as far as I'm gonna go for now. I told Dr. Joe I wanted to give a shout out to our friends at the University of Pennsylvania and also our friends at Temple University right here in Philadelphia. But as I said, this, I think, is a highlight from a long career. Dr. Joe has served as team dentist to the Philadelphia 76ers. That's pretty cool. And right now, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Joe Greenberg. Dr. Joe, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And it uh, could be a scary topic, but totally essential in the world we live in now. Perhaps um, you can share with us things we need to know for the world we live in now. Thanks, Dr. Joe. Thank you, Pam. And thank you for all the work you've done setting this up and arranging it. And to my Rotarian friends, John Douglas is on, and I think Theodora Bulgaris is on. Thank you both for helping out to, to, make, this, uh, to make this work. So we do want to talk about oral health and how it impacts our overall health. And I'm going to start with a pretty bold statement. And that bold statement, if I can get this to work, is better oral health might save your life. Now, that's kind of bold, I think, for those who might have just had dinner and been quieting down a bit. But I hope to substantiate that claim with the information that I'm going to share with you this evening. It's very important that we look to science. When we look to science, to just be clear about that, my science comes from peer-reviewed journals, not, uh, public, not uh, public publications or advertisements or that sort of thing. So let's start with this very important uh, piece. Uh, by the way, so uh, I think it's important to remember that I am a periodontist and a prosthodontist because that's going to come up. And I also want you to notice that I am the founder and first president of Kid Smiles, and we might get a chance to mention Kid Smiles. 
I'm very proud of that. And that has nothing to do <laughs> with the first two things, periodontist and prosthodontist. Uh, and kid smiles, it would be more of a pediatric or children's dentist, which I'm not. But I, uh, thanks to some very important people, one of whom is on the call, Stacy, uh, they let me play in that arena. Well, speaking of arenas, here's a big one. For the first time in 14 years, the World Health Organization, that's, there's only one of those, you know, and the World Health Organization came to a conclusion on January 21st of 2021 that achieving better oral health is part of the universal health coverage. What's universal health coverage? We can kind of think about that. Uh, there isn't one yet, but they would like there to be, and they'll mention that later on. And non-communicable disease agendas. So they're on it. They are very clear that oral health is part of overall health and very important to overall health. So let's define oral health. According to the World Health Organization, oral health is a key indicator of overall health, well being, and quality of life. I'm putting that in a different color, and that's going to come up that color a number of times. It encompasses a range of diseases and conditions that include dental caries, caries that's cavities, periodontal disease or gum disease, tooth loss, oral cancer, oral manifestations of HIV, orodental trauma, noma, which is a horrible condition if you want to look that up, and birth defects such as cleft lip and palate. So that's what the WHO defines it. The World Dental Federation, the FDI, defines it a little bit differently. Oral health is multifaceted and includes the ability to speak, smile, smell, taste, touch, chew, swallow, and convey a range of emotions through facial expressions with confidence and without pain, discomfort, and disease of the craniofacial complex. And then one more, the American Dental Association, which is, as you know, the largest official representative body of dentists in the United States. And they say that oral health is a functional, structural, aesthetic, physiologic, and psychosocial state of well-being, and it's essential to an individual general health and quality of life. So if you came into this evening thinking that oral health was tooth decay, now we're seeing that it's much, much, much bigger than that. And here is our Director General of the WHO, Dr. Tedros, and what's he saying? Oral health has been overlooked for too long in the global health agenda. 14 years after the last consideration of oral health by EB60, today's resolution provides a welcome opportunity to address the public health challenges posed by the burden of oral diseases, plural, to reposition oral health as part of the global health agenda in the context of what, what is it? Here it is again, UHC, universal health coverage. So clearly the WHO has this concept in mind of universal health coverage. We can only think about that. The resolution, from the executive board, that's what the EB means, executive board of the World Health Organization. So to understand and address the key risk factors for poor oral health and burden of disease, to foster the integration of oral health within national policies, to reorient the traditional curative approach, basically pathogenic, and move towards a preventive promotional approach with risk identification, for comprehensive and inclusive care, to promote the development and implementation of policies to promote workforce models for oral health services, to facilitate the development and implementation of effective surveillance monitoring systems, to map and track the concentration of fluoride in drinking water. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, fluoride in drinking water turns out to be one of the key public health measures that we've ever done in the United States of America. Do we have fluoride? If you go to the library right now where you are, if you're in the suburbs and not in Philadelphia, do you have fluoride in your water, controlled community fluoridation? No, you don't. I'm sad to say, but in most of our suburbs, some of which are quite affluent, fluoride water is not found. 
Now, really? When I say fluoride in drinking water, I mean controlled, purposely uh, um, controlled and monitored fluoride in the water. That's 0.7 parts per million. And that is correct. It is not in our uh, water system in Philadelphia Suburban Water Company. It is in the city. We'd love to see it in every community water supply in, the, in Pennsylvania. Why don't we? Uh, there's pushback. There are people that have uh, specific ideas that they don't want fluoride in the water. But a big complication is there are 50 or 60 or, or hundreds of individual little water companies controlling the water in given communities. So it's really, really tough even if they all wanted to do it, to get to them, to, to cool. provide information, to provide systems, it's very difficult. But people are working on it. The PCOH, the Pennsylvania Coalition for Oral Health, is on it. They are working very hard to get every community to consider placing controlled fluoride into the drinking water. To strengthen the provision of oral health services delivery as part of the essential health services package that again deliver universal health coverage. So this is what they're saying. What is this essential health services package? We don't have one. There really isn't one in the world yet, but the WHO would like to see that. And they're gonna try their best to get it. To improve oral health worldwide by creating an oral health friendly environment, reducing risk factors, strengthening a quality assured oral health care system. So the World Health Organization is taking the lead and they have many partners and stakeholders. You see some of them here on the left-hand side, the Lancet Commission on Oral Health, which publishes a highly credible journal. We're gonna see a piece that was published by the Lancet Commission on oral health coming up. The United Nations and others, the Cochrane Group. I mean, these are very credible, high quality, Medical it's and a nice piece right here. This one, yeah. Yeah. no price on it, but it's nice. Go for it. Yeah. Someone want to ask a question? It is comfortable. That's comfortable. Somebody's talking. Okay. If you if you do, if you want to ask a question, you're welcome to do that. If not, please mute yourself. So there are member states, there are chief dental officers all over the world, and if you look on the right hand side you'll see where these WHO collaborative centers are. Dr. Bueno, ben, bueno, bueno Varen is the chief dental officer of the World Health Organization, and he uh, made these slides. So here's something that I really would like you to focus on. You, met, you saw mentioned the burden of oral diseases. Look at the size of this sphere, ladies and gentlemen. It's bigger than any of the others. And probably if we took several of the others, maybe it's as big as all of the others combined. Oral disorders is huge. And as we're going to see, it impacts mental disorders, cardiovascular disease, diabetes mellitus, chronic respiratory disease, and cancers. All of them are impacted by either poor in a negative way or positive in a positive way uh, oral health. Is oral health an essential health service? Uh, depends on who you ask. Now, if you ask the WHO, they're very clear that it is. Populations most in need of oral health care receive the least, and conversely, those who need it the least receive the most. Let me digress on that just a little bit. I have been a dentist for almost 50 years. That's a long time. And so hopefully I've learned some things along the way. Yes, I had wonderful teachers, no question. But I also learned a lot from my patients, one of whom is on the line tonight, maybe uh, actually a few are on the line tonight. And what I've learned from some of my patients is that people who have the access, not everyone does. People who happen to be fortunate enough to have the finances, to have access to oral health care can have the best. Sometimes they do have it and sometimes they choose not to. And I've seen it and I'm sure you can imagine it, but there are people who could afford anything but choose not to spend it on their oral health care. Why? 
because they don't think it's important to their health and well being. Well, I hope that some of this information that's initiated by the World Health Organization is going to get out to those folks because they have great possibilities. On the other hand, there are those who are really in need who don't have the access. And that is very, very unfortunate because without that possibility, without that oral health in their lives, they suffer. They suffer on many levels. And we're gonna talk about that as we go along. Who needs oral health? Children, adults, the poor disadvantaged, what are the consequences and sequela of poor oral health? We gotta look at that. Better oral health reduces chronic disease and increases quality of life. Is this opinion or science? I'm gonna show you that it's science. How has the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic affected oral health? Anybody know for sure out there? Maybe, I bet you have a guess. We're gonna look at that information as well. Experts report that poor children's oral health has suffered most due to the closures and stoppage of oral health care during the pandemic. The government told dentists to close down and dental schools to close down and dental clinics who treated poor kids were forced to shut down. Where did, what happened to these kids as a result? Can they ever catch up? Will previous care levels ever be resumed? What will it take to catch up? The universal need for oral health care as part of overall health care has been articulated since the 2000 Surgeon General's report. Why has it not been done? That's like 21 years ago, ladies and gentlemen. What's taken so long? The World Health Organization admits it's been slow. But wh what about any, every other possibility? It just hasn't. It hasn't happened. Even though the Surgeon General, David Satcher in 2000, was pretty sharp. Now, he had help. There were some pretty bright people helping him write that report. But they looked and they saw how important oral health was to overall health. Unfortunately, they didn't sell it. Proposals are being discussed to add dental coverage to Medicare. You may have heard about that. We can talk about that later on if you'd like. Will that pay for my crowns and implants? What coverage is essential? We have to talk about that. Oral disease can have drastic effects on quality of life, as you may remember from the definitions, in terms of function, pain, and self-perception. Such effects on quality of life might not be captured when examining naturally occurring dental outcomes, that is tooth decay. So measuring tooth decay is not enough. By the way, I see I spelled this wrong, I'll fix that later. Tooth decay, which is what is measured by a lot of organizations and official with official status. That's what they're measuring, tooth decay and missing teeth. And they think that that's a snapshot, that that's a screening. Of, of children's oral health. It's not enough, ladies and gentlemen. It's not enough. Let's look at this uh, article, which was published in the ADA Journal, which is our, you know, the, the Journal of the American Dental Association by Robert Wayant, who's a dentist epidemiologist in the United States at University of Pittsburgh, and Richard Watt, who's a dentist epidemiologist in the United Kingdom. And these are public health dentists. These are, these are people who are trained differently than, than yours truly. What did they say? So they looked at the Lancet Oral Health Series, which stresses global public health importance of oral disease in terms of prevalence, impact, and cost of the urgent need to radically reform oral health care organization and delivery. Socially disadvantaged groups such as rural and urban poor many ethnic minorities and the institutionalized elderly, let's not forget them, are constantly at risk of access to care. They just can't walk out the door and get in a cab and go to a dentist. Having large segments of a population experiencing chronic untreated oral disease is an economic drag on families and communities. School and job performance suffer as do employability and here it is, quality of life. Through changes in practice acts and reimbursement, access to preventive and early intervention dental services can be expanded into nurseries, 
schools, nursing homes, work sites, medical clinics, homeless care facilities, and other community locations. We can bring services to the people. Maybe not all dental services, but some very essential, important ones. Movement towards value-based payments. That's an insurance term, as you can well imagine. Our further incentivized early and coordinated disease prevention across healthcare disciplines. The response, this is also from this article, and this is a big, I'm putting it in big bold. The responsibility for, reduce, for reducing the burden of oral disease falls well beyond just the dental profession. All healthcare professionals, government at all levels, and payers of health service delivery must accept that they all have an important responsibility for ensuring all Americans achieve and maintain oral health. Everybody can help. So if we want our citizens to rise the ladder to success from wherever they are to grow and, and have time and health and leadership and training and motivation, all of these things, we wanna give our children and our young people all of this, but are they gonna make it to success without oral health? I think not. So public health approach to oral health. As I mentioned, oral health, uh, Public health dentists are trained differently. They do studies, they do epidemiology. And so this is, a, this is a diagram drawn by a public health dentist. What are we looking at here? We're talking about prevention, upstream and downstream. What's upstream prevention? Stopping the disease before it gets hold. Downstream prevention is dealing with the disease. And I must tell you on the downstream side, I've heard it said by many experts, we cannot treat our way out of dental disease. Dental disease is so widespread and pervasive around the world that we couldn't possibly have enough. If we doubled, tripled, quadrupled the number of dentists, wouldn't make a dent. We need upstream solutions more than downstream solutions. And that's where we need to focus. Th something that will stop the disease before it gets hold. And there are some ideas and concepts that are coming out about that. So we need population-wide oral health interventions, targeted individual clinical interventions, and clear focus on oral health promotion and empowerment for effective self-care. Let me give you just one example. So what happens when a child is born and at six months they go in for their first well baby visit? Wouldn't it be great if the physician's team could have a dental focus at that point in time? Get the, get the mom and the child on the right road with certain medications if teeth have erupted, and sometimes by six months, there are some teeth. They can have, we can have fluoride applied. These are harmless kinds of things. A screening should be done, looking for other things besides tooth decay, like what? like obstructive sleep apnea, which is found in young children and can be treated in young children. No one's even looking. If no one's looking, those are kids that are gonna suffer terribly. So that's just one small example. Universal oral health equity. I'm sure you've heard the term equity as opposed to equality. If we look at the left-hand side, this is an equality. So there's fruit on the tree and everybody has an equal chance to get it, but do they? If you're vertically challenged, then that's not gonna work. So here's equity. We go from equality to equity. Those who need it need a boost. They need a stool to stand on in this, in this particular diagram. So universal oral health coverage is a key element. Those who need it most need it more. We need to devise ways to get them a head start to give those back, the ones who haven't had it because of the closures of COVID. We need to find ways to stimulate and to bring oral health to our disadvantaged, I think, children more than any. Preventing chronic disease. Here's a piece that was published as part of a government publication, Addressing Oral Health Inequities, Access to Care, Knowledge, and Behaviors. Oral health is essential to overall health and dental public health is a field of public health and a specialized field of dentistry 
that focuses on improving access to oral health care and understanding the factors that contribute to improving oral health from a population health perspective. Periodontitis was the dental condition most frequently correlated with chronic systemic diseases. This is more in adults. So the CDC's numbers are 47.2% of adults 30 and older have some level of periodontitis. Periodontitis is gum disease, gum disease that's deep. So superficial gum disease is called gingivitis. That's not what this says. This says periodontitis. Periodontitis affects the bone around the tooth. So that's 47.2% of adults age 30 and older. You can imagine that by age 65, that number goes way up, try 70%. So that's a very high number of people who have gum disease. And most of the time, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you as an expert, gum disease does not hurt. So if you're, a, if you're a, a, a proponent of the old expression, if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know, that's wrong. <laughs> We need to find out if we have periodontal disease and get it treated. Access to dental care for prevention and treatment is critical to ensure optimal oral health. Healthy People 2030, which is a government publication, oral health objective aid is to increase the proportion of children, adolescents, and adults who use the oral health care system. Children and adolescents living below 200% of the federal poverty level had almost twice the untreated decay as those living at or above. So they're measuring it by decay. As you know, that's not the whole story, but that's what we have. If we look out into, the, into what's being measured in the United States and around the world, tooth decay is high on the list. I say it's not enough, and I hope you understand that from what I'm showing you that it's not enough, but it's what we have preventing chronic disease also. Caregivers who brush their teeth were more likely to brush their children's teeth as well, makes sense. And having additional caregivers assist with brushing the child's teeth was associated with both higher brushing frequency and lower plaque score. Uh, there are studies, I recall a, a Fit for Life program that was done in the Philippines where they brought toothpaste, and, uh, fluoride toothpaste and toothbrushes into schools, into primary elementary schools for the teachers to brush the kids' teeth. They did it. They cut the decay rate like crazy. Could we do it here in the United States? No, there's all kinds of rules about that. I'm sure Stacy could tell us about that. But so we know sometimes things work, but we can't do them due to various regulations, but that doesn't mean we can't stop. We have to find a way. This study points to the need to evaluate family support structures when assessing risk factors for oral disease in young children and for oral health professionals to promote additional caregiver and family support in implementing an oral health regimen among infants and toddlers. Boy, I think that is such an opportunity for us to focus on the, on the pre and post-natal uh, uh, women and the, and the newborns. Creative interventions that facilitate behavior change in parents may help lower the risk for development of dental caries in children. There are some studies out of, out of Scandinavia, folks, I have to tell you, where the mother, the mother, the pregnant mother, chews high xylitol chewing gum. Uh, you know, we can talk about that a little later if we, if we can, but that high xylitol chewing gum cuts down the ability of the mom to transmit strep mutans, which are the bacteria mostly associated with tooth decay. Their children in this study had no cavities up to age six, and the children didn't need to do anything. So yes, there are possibilities that need to get further scientific substantiation in the United States, even though they have scientific substantiation in other countries. COVID-19 can lead to victim mentality, which diminishes resilience and weakens the immune system. The woe is me. It also reduces motivation for self-help. And this was a WHO survey. Preventive dental care can significantly improve oral health in children. 
I think that uh, deserves every, every bit that we can. I hate to give up on the seniors like me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but the kids really deserve our best efforts. Authors recommend collaborative health promotion and education efforts that draw on various groups of people, including oral health professionals, pediatricians, school nurses, and teachers. And we're starting to see some of that happen. The second Surgeon General's report on oral health is expected to be released in 2021, hasn't been released yet. The first one messaged that oral health meant much more than healthy teeth and is integral to the overall health and well being of the US population. I can't underestimate the kinds of, sta of statements that have been made by prominent people with knowledge. Addressing the social, behavioral, and environmental determinants of health as part of oral health care offers a new approach to prevention and treatment. The most important healthcare system in the world, who wants to take a guess? What is the most important healthcare system in the world according to the Gates Foundation? What's the answer? Anybody know? Somebody wanna unmute and give me the answer? So the answer is a mother. A mother is the most important healthcare system in the world. If we educate and coach mothers, the whole family gets healthy. So principle number two, universal oral health coverage through primary health care. Primary health care is, is a key. Lots and lots of folks are seeking primary health care. And pediatricians and their teams are busy as can be. But that doesn't mean that they can't find the time in a well in, to have a well-integrated oral health experience for children and a referral. If all they can do is five minutes or 10 minutes, we can tell them what to do, and then they have the opportunity to refer. But we need to integrate this. That will, that will explode the size of the army that we have to help us with oral health care, especially for young children. So what's integration of healthcare? Is this integration? No, <laughs> that means the doctor's office is here and the dentist's office is here. And sometimes they talk and maybe sometimes they refer, but that's not integration. This isn't integration either, where there's one big building and there's a dental office in there and there are physician's offices in there, but they don't necessarily work together. This is the kind of integration we're seeking where people are working together. This is uh, the work of Dr. Habib Benzian, who's a brilliant researcher in, in global oral health. And we're gonna look at what happens when some of this is going on. Uh, you'll see shortly. Is there information to show that better oral health reduces chronic disease? So if this is working, then the answer to this question would have to be yes, don't you think? Well, here is Ed Murphy, and he's an MBA. He's not a physician, not a dentist, not a nurse, not a hygienist. He's an MBA, and he's in charge of this study. The LSVs are parts of the Blue Cross Blue Shield, and they partnered with the Mayo Clinic to study and validate the healthcare cost savings that partners have documented, documented as a result of our Dental for Health, Dental for Health program and processes. So in this Mayo Clinic, they're doing the inclusion. They're treating patients together, physicians and dentists. They're seeing the patient, they're diagnosing all that needs to be done. And those who needed periodontal care needed to get it. Their coverage was there. They're paying one fee to the insurance entity to, to cover this, okay? And so they, the, the people who are driving it, had to make sure that people showed up for care. So they had compliance, they had compliance officers, they had compliance staff, and they were able to up the compliance of people. So one thing is telling me that I need periodontal treatment. The other thing is getting me into the chair. Well, they found a way to get it. As a result, ladies and gentlemen, look at this. This is new data. It's not the only study that's been done, but it's very impressive. Look at the savings, 30%, 30% in all disease categories by those who had better oral health. 
30% of hospital costs. Does anyone here besides Alex Kukas even know what the hospital costs are in the United States? It's an unbelievable number. 30% of savings? That's incredible, folks. That's incredible. Now, if you look, you see the bars start to go down. What happens in years four and five? Why did the bars start to go down? So someone asked Ed, I, I was on a, you know, a, a Zoom with him, and he said, well, the insurance company cut the reimbursements. <laughs> so now that they see they're saving money, they're going to cut the reimbursement. That's another problem that uh, you know, we're, I, I care not to discuss right now. But that's who's going to drive it. If the major insurers know that having a healthy mouth is going to keep you out of the hospital, you can bet you're going to be pushed to get your mouth healthy. So be wary and be, and you will see this is coming. This is mostly in the Northwest of the United States right now, Kaiser Permanente and, and other um, insurance organizations out there, but it's coming East in a very, very uh, substantial way. Anybody have any questions, by the way, before we go further? Um, Dr. Cho? Yes. I, I made a few notes here because I, I do agree with you 100%. It's very interesting that you present that research. But I think, like you said, access, must have access. Education, of course, education. That seems to be the answer to everything these days, education. Dealing with that cost, with you, you know that health care. Because when you think of it, if you go through life with, without this kind of, uh, you know, without seeing your dentist, without having education or access or having somebody somewhere pay for it, it could be crippling when you're an older person and you could want to have a wonderful career, but feel a certain amount of shame because of something silent that's been going on with your mouth and suddenly you're in pain and your teeth are falling out and you feel, I can't, I'm not in a position to present myself to the world in this condition. Do you see what I, the snowballing of it? Pam, you're absolutely right. I, I People can be crippled if they don't like their smile, especially in this country where we all live and we know this. I recall want... a very dear patient of mine who I treated, who was, I won't say her name. She was, if, if I said her name, you would know that she was unbelievably wealthy, could have anything she wanted. And she needed some work done on her front teeth. And she, I told her, you know, please do it. You're getting up in years. She said, nah, it doesn't bother me, leave it alone. So she became housebound and her teeth fell out and no one could do anything. She was so miserable. She would, could afford anything, but she couldn't turn the clock back and get her teeth fixed. Yeah. So that can happen. Yes. And, uh, people are I living know it's longer. extreme. It's yeah. extreme, but you'll often just go online and look and see what the implant dentistry field has done for yes. people who didn't have the benefit of an educator or access or someone paying the bill. At least at some point in life, something happens and maybe they get rescued. And I mean rescued because there are dentists who do volunteer work like yourself and they'll get implants, changes their life, can change their life. That's all I wanted to mention that because I, I'm agreeing with you and if anybody else wants to say anything. Anybody? I see that I'm, I'm, I'm going too slowly here. So I'm gonna try to- Thanks Dr. Joe. <laughs> thanks, thanks, keep going. Okay. So the oral health workforce has to respond and we need to expand it by having additional uh, uh, people involved, trained people. Um, building the capacity of patients, families, and carers, as well as healthcare providers. People with knowledge can help. How about some dental myth busting? True or false, all bacteria in the mouth cause tooth decay. What do you think? Stacy says, no, she's right. Over 500 different species of microbes inhabit the oral cavity. Most of these are harmless. The bacteria most commonly associated with tooth decay is strep mutans. True or false, fluoride is dangerous to add to toothpaste and water. It can cause bone cancer. What's the answer? 
False, fluoride helps make teeth strong. In fact, if I take an extracted tooth and I dip it in a fluoride solution and leave it overnight, the surface of that tooth gets harder, even though it's no longer getting uh, blood supply from the human, be uh, human being. I don't need to floss every day if I brush my teeth. Wrong. You need to clean between the teeth. Teeth are three-dimensional objects. So be it floss or something else, interproximal brushes, uh, toothpicks, whatever one is good at. Alcohol and tobacco aren't harmful to the mouth. False. Alcohol and tobacco are thought to account for up to 90% of oral, oral and pharyngeal cancers. Electric toothbrushes and manual toothbrushes offer the same quality of brushing? False. While manual toothbrushes work fine, electric toothbrushes are better and sonic powered toothbrushes even more effective. And those who might be feeling some arthritis and inability to use the, their hands as they did uh, years ago will certainly benefit from electric and sonic powered toothbrushes. 30% of Americans don't brush their teeth at least twice a day. What do you think? <laughs> True. Cavities, gum disease, and tooth pain quickly develop when people do not brush their teeth. It only takes 24 hours for the plaque biofilm on your teeth to start to harden into calculus, 24 hours. So we have one shot in 24 hours not to remove the plaque biofilm really, but to disorganize it so that it does not organize into this kind of harmful form. True or floss? <laughs> True or floss? Flossing or other interdental cleaning tools used every day can stop your gums from bleeding. Indeed. So there are other devices. These are only two, there are many, but find what you need, find what works for you and use it. You must clean between your teeth. Gum disease starts between the teeth, not on the outer or inner surfaces. If my mouth doesn't hurt, do I need to see a dentist? Well, you know my answer to that one. Absolutely positively, because very frequently gum disease and diabetes, Crohn's disease, oral cancer and STIs, which we can see by changes in the mouth are not picked up if you're not in the dental office. Beverages with added sugar. Uh, such as energy drinks can lead to cavities. Absolutely. So, you know, there was a big controversy with the mayor of Philadelphia and this beverage tax. There are many who say it was brilliant. If there's one thing that Richard Watt, who's that epidemiologist from, Cat, from the UK, if there's one thing that we could do it would be cut consumption of sugar. The United States of America, we're more than 10 times any country in the world. That's a horrible, horrible thing. We need to find a way to cut down on sugar sweetened foods and beverages. You know, Dr. Joe, I was yes. watching a uh, PBS one time and they were interviewing a doctor about diet and specifically sugar. And it was so profound. This lady doctor said, let me tell you, she said, you're better off eating nothing. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the look on the interviewer's face, she said, I mean, that sugar is so bad. You're better off eating nothing. So I always think about that. That was pretty profound. Yes. <laughs> Frayed bristles can scratch off the enamel. So we want a new toothbrush about every three months. <clears throat> These are the references. This is a great one, by the way, mouthhealthy.org. Is a website put out by the ADA that you will find updated, very, very important information. Oral health and well being across the life course, absolutely positively, is essential for health and longevity. What are the biologic, physiologic links? Uh, I'm sorry that I'm so late here with, my, with the way I'm running late, but for those who really want to delve into the science, there is this. This is one example. Dr. Van Dyke is at the Forsyth Institute in, in um, Boston. Uncontrolled inflammation amplified by immune responses is largely responsible for the tissue destruction we see in periodontitis. The pathophysiology of periodontitis is attributable to the actions of certain lipid mediators. 
these same mediators play an important role in the pathogenesis of type two diabetes. New understanding is that resolution of inflammation is an active process, not a passive decay of pro-inflammatory molecules as previously believed. Excessive inflammation is a critical component of the common diseases of aging, including periodontitis, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and associated with obesity. Approximately 50% of the US population has some degree of periodontal disease. Type two diabetes doubles that risk. Periodontitis, type two diabetes, and cardiovascular disease all involve inflammation mediated microvascular and macrovascular changes, disruption of lipid metabolism, glycosylation of proteins, and other abnormalities. Emerging evidence suggests that non resolving inflammation is a critical underlying factor of both periodontitis and type two diabetes. The new observation that excess inflammation makes infection worse, not better, and periodontis clearly imparts a risk in animal models, and even mediators providing dose-dependent against the onset of periodontitis and atherogenesis reduces the intima-media ratio. So what is that? What's happening with the inflammation, it's stirring up trouble inside our blood vessels, and they start to close. We can treat them in an animal model, not in humans yet, and show that we can get those vessels to reopen. This is extraordinary stuff. This I won't go into, but here's a link if you want to copy it or take a, a screenshot of it for nutrition counseling for obesity prevention. This just came out from Temple Dental School, Dr. Marisol Marsh, Marchand, working with the Center for Obesity Research and Education has come up with a program specifically for obese, nutrition counseling for obesity prevention in the dental setting. This is something we talked about doing at Kid Smiles. We never got to it. And now there's an opportunity maybe that we will get back into it. SARS and oral health. Wow, I'm running towards the end here, but this is pretty important, don't you think? Is better oral health important to resisting SARS COVID-2 infection? How does one catch SARS-CoV-2? Stepping in it? No. Sitting in it? No. Breathing it in. Someone challenges you with, with, a, with an aerosol droplet that's going to get into one of these passages. Notice that it's the eye, it's the nose, it's the mouth. And what we're looking for then, if we're tracing these, are the AC2s and the TMPRSS2 for, okay? These are the virus particles that enter our respiratory cells. SARS-CoV-2 infection of the oral cavity and saliva. This is straight from the uh, NIH. Severe acute respiratory syndrome, viral entry factors such as AC2 and TMPRSS. Members were broadly enriched epithelial cells of the glands and oral mucosa, that's the mouth. Using orthogonal RNA and protein expression assessments, we confirmed that. Saliva infected individuals harbored epithelial cells, acellular and cellular salivary fractions from asymptomatic individuals were found to transmit it. So if you're asymptomatic, but it's in your saliva, you're a transmitter. Collectively, these data show that the oral cavity is an important site for SARS-CoV-2 infection and implicates saliva as a potential route of viral transmission. So what can we do? Get vaccinated, if that's what you choose to do, great. Is that the only thing you can do? The answer is really no. There are other possibilities. And one of them is intranasal therapy. So if you see that the virus is entering through the mouth, the nose, or the eyes, what can we do to challenge to, to strengthen that system with health. Intranasal therapy is, is one answer. It, so SARS is highly virulent, transmissible, vir primarily through respiratory droplets and close contact. Viral entry through the nose or mouth using the re AC2 receptors is critical. Studies reviewed note that using nasal spray 
with antiviral properties, has promising efficiency and safety in the treatment and prophylaxis against SARS-CoV-2. Authors propose that intranasal administration of antiviral and virucidal therapies decrease the viral activity in the nasal pathways, helps prevent disease transmission, expedites recovery of mild to moderate COVID-19 patients, and decreases symptom severity and reduces hospitalizations and mortality. Antiviral agents with intranasal use potential, let's look at them. All can be used in the outpatient setting. All are available to everybody on this call. One is xylitol and grapefruit seed extract. Both xylitol, which is a naturally occurring sugar alcohol, and grapefruit seed extract in separate series of studies show effective antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses started out a long time ago with the flu. Used in combination in a nasal spray, they reduce COVID-2 symptoms in four days and reduce the time to negativization by 50%. Also in red is molecular iodine. It kills SARS-CoV-2 through iodinization of lipids and oxidation of cytoplasmic membrane compounds. So if you go into my old office today and you pre-rinse before treatment, what are you pre-rinsing with? Molecular iodine because that's effective. Intranasal corticosteroids does have some, uh, can reduce sneezing. Notice that the two in red are the, the ones I want you to think about. Surfactants and shampoos can help entrap viruses. Hydrogen peroxide and chloramphyramine have both shown in vivo and in vitro antiviral properties, but the mechanism of action is unknown. So let's focus on the, those, those in red. Whether you've had your vaccination or not, this is a way you can put yourself a little higher on the road towards resisting these hor this horrible pandemic. Oh, an acid buffered uh, hypertonic saline. Some say salt water rinsing, but it really isn't as effective. These are the studies, these are results of studies showing what really works. So intranasal therapy expedites recovery, changes symptom and severity improvement, decreases rate of hospitalization. It's used as a post-exposure prophylaxis, helps healthcare workers to not spread infection. This is a, something that really needs to be looked at and is not being looked at officially yet. I hope it will be. <laughs> what is the association between income loss during the COVID pandemic and children's dental care? Uh, this was a study done in Pittsburgh by Bob Weyant, who showed three times as many households reported unmet dental care for a child compared with unmet medical care. Non-traditional strategies are needed for delivering dental care if we ever want to catch up. Poverty, inequality, and COVID-19, the forgotten vulnerable. COVID-19 does not discriminate. It's a, it's, that's a dangerous myth. Poor people, what happens to poor people? Why are they more at risk? They're more likely to live in overcrowded condition, have jobs that do not allow work from home, have unstable work conditions and income, are subject to higher stress, which weakens the immune system. They present for healthcare at more advanced stages of illness, which results in poorer health outcomes, experiencing more difficulty navigating the health service offerings, and have reduced confidence that will be treated with respect. Emerging evidence that hypertension and diabetes are risk factors for death from COVID-19. Poverty itself is a risk factor for hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. Uh, let's, let's see, maybe we'll skip this one. <laughs> Essential oral health care covers the most prevalent oral health problems through an agreed set of safe, quality, and cost-effective interventions, that's upstream, and the individual and community level to promote and protect oral health, as well as prevent and treat common oral diseases, including appropriate rehabilitative services, thereby maintaining health, productivity, and quality of life. Remember, quality of life. Basic oral health care, having your teeth cleaned, is so safe, efficient, and cost-effective that it can be provided universally, irrespective of whether or not there is a public health emergency. 
this could be certainly the first item to include if Medicare decides to in increase and in, uh, go into dentistry. So who can help me with my oral disease? Your dentist, your dentist absolutely positively. If you're an adult over 30, have your dentist examine you carefully for periodontal disease, absolutely positively. The American Dental Association, if you wanna reach out to them. The, pa uh, the Pennsylvania Dental Association wants to help. The Kornberg School of Dentistry can help. That's their number. The University of Penn School of Dental Medicine can help, and that's their phone number. And there is a CVIN, Community Volunteers in Medicine. Alberta Landis is the contact person, and that's her phone number for those who need help financially and need dental treatment, oral health care. So I'm sorry I've exhausted my hour because I was going to talk about this. <laughs> I guess I'm not going to talk about kid smiles. I, I certainly. No, uh, Dr. Joe, we're good. We have time. Good? Okay. Yeah, sure. Go right oh, ahead. Everybody has to go. I would, to love, I would love to hear about this. Well, I'd love to talk about it. And Believe so would me. everyone else. Go ahead. Kid Smiles we, uh, is, a, is a nonprofit that I was fortunate enough to initiate back in around 1997, 98. And we opened our first clinic in 2001. You can tell by counting the numbers that we're 20 years old now. And mm -hmm. Stacey Benner, who is on the call, is one of the most important people to Kid Smiles because she's, she's in charge of education. And mm -hmm. education, outreach, and screening is a key difference maker for Kid Smiles. We are teaching kids how to take care of themselves, how to eat the banana, not the candy bar. And mm -hmm. such simple lessons, which they get, little kids get it, and they get it right. Yeah. So our mission is, as you see, is to provide children in underserved communities with preventive and restorative oral health care, as well as innovative health education programs, focusing on the prevention of dental disease and the development of positive personal health behaviors. Kid Smile's goal is health empowerment. Here are some facts and figures from some years ago. We did treated at that time 73,000 children. I think these were the 2015 numbers. 86% of Kid Smiles patients were returning patients. We were told this wouldn't happen. Baloney. 91% of Kid Smiles patients have public insurance or are completely uninsured. We treat them anyway. The Grin and Charit program provided at that time over $300,000 worth of free care annually. 20,000 children and adults receive oral health education annually. Educate, educate, educate. Thank you, Stacy. <laughs> Kid Smiles has over 200 community partners and 80% of all donations directly support Kid Smiles programs. So these are some of, of the, the programs that we have, as you see. And here are some photos from the clinics. Uh, the educators, as you see this young lady sitting here, She's not, she's not doing that in between treating patients. That's her job. She's sitting there doing this all day as long as there are kids there who want to listen. So that's an important part of Kid Smiles. We have skilled, talented, willing educators who are there to help the children. Uh, there's general education, the Dental Detectives Academy, volunteer program, prevention programs, community events. Here's another example of education and outreach programs. And this is one of our kids. Some years ago, we had a throne in the reception room and it was very <laughs> special for a child to sit in that throne. Somehow when they sat in that throne, they, they expressed just what you see on his face. That's a nonverbal communication that's absolutely stellar. This is all for me because I'm special and I'm worth it. So thank you for listening. Sorry I ran over a bit. And I'm happy to take your questions. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joe. That was wonderful. And ending with kids smiles is very uplifting. And anyone, questions, comments for Dr. Greenberg? I'd like to make a comment. Um, I am a, I am a bit biased because I always uh, like to thank Dr. Joe for my job because oh, kids, there's Stacy. Yeah, 
<laughs> Kid Smiles was born out of um, his mind, but most especially his heart. And the mission and his dream for this mission speaks to so many of the criteria that we he spoke about today and that um, was suggested um, in terms of, you know, overall health. So it's the access to care. Kid Smiles treats all children. We have free care. We have um, staff that stays forever. I've been a Kid Smiles for more than 15 years now because we love the mission. But what's more important about that is the fact that when kids come back, they see the same staff all the time. We're in the community. We actually have 300 community partners now, not 200. Mm -hmm. We have three mm -hmm. locations and we're rooted in the community. We build our centers in the very communities that we're serving. So you have trust. Trust leads to access, right? right. We have the education program. And you know our mission is to treat disease but prevent future incidents of disease through education and very much to what um, was shared today, tonight with Dr. Joe's presentation, we really target the adults in the family. We want to empower the adults and help them to understand that they are the, they are the role model period for their family, but especially when it comes to health. So, you know, Kid Smiles is a 20 something year old organization and we're working on every front to kind of combat all the challenges that were mentioned. And I just want to share that I've been out in the field a lot lately mm -hmm. and I am stunned by what I am seeing clinically and behaviorally in daycare centers and in schools. A lot of trauma has occurred as a result of COVID. A lot of trauma has occurred as a result of being isolated, staying home, not having a schedule, not having a structure, children, have been home eating and drinking whatever they want, whenever they want. They have not been going for their dental exams. I had a meeting with the Philadelphia School District this afternoon with their early childhood education program. Parents are still afraid to take their children in for dental exams. So like the barriers that we've been talking about as long as I've been in this field, I think have grown exponentially as a result of COVID. Mm -hmm. Just something to think about, but um, Kid Smiles is a beautiful mission, like I said, born out of Dr. Greenberg's heart. And, you know, one day when you have nothing to do, go to our website, it's kidsmiles.org. And you can see, you know, learn more about what we do. And there's videos and all kinds of good stuff to illustrate that. Thanks, Dr. Joe. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks, Stacey. Okay, I think we are really out of time right now, but I'd like to thank Dr. Joe, Dr. Joseph R. Greenberg, our presenter this evening, a 25-year Rotarian, and I'm sure a lot of people here tonight, Rotarians, part of that international organization. And also, I want to shout out to Doug Blasey, the current president, and also, I know John Douglas, past president of Radnor Rotary. I'm sorry, I say Radnor, but it is Wayne, right here in Radnor Township. Pennsylvania. So um, really thank you everyone for joining us. Radnor Memorial Library, our patrons are here this evening, I know, and um, I hope to see you at the library. And I do really want to thank Rotary International and our local. It is about local. We're local by design. So thanks, Dr. Greenberg, for being here tonight. It was informative. I think of this as a science this is one of those STEM things for adults. <laughs> and I learned a lot tonight. So thank you and good night. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Dr. Joe. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs>